I don't know if you want to get started. I can start. Yeah, there. I'll go ahead and call it to order. And it looks like your commission might be at full uh, at uh, capacity too. That's uh, okay. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started since four thirty. Good afternoon. Welcome to our April 6, 2021 special meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on into our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. The Water Commission was invited to virtually attend today's meeting as well. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's City Council meeting. Please mute. If you wish to comment on today's agenda item, call in during the staff presentation using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note, there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. Then press star six to speak. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Watkins? Here. Calentari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Oh, there he is. Okay. Um, Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? I'm present. We have just one agenda item today, and that is the policy briefing and action on various water department long-term financial planning and rate making topics. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you are wanting to comment on this, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council, we will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Cut. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to our water director, uh, Rosemary Menard. And uh, Rosemary, we are ready for the presentation and discussion tonight. Great, thank you so much, council members, uh, mayor. Myers and Vice Mayor uh, Bruner uh, for making this time available. It's really um, it's a privilege to have a concentrated hour with you or so in the, in the next uh, little bit to talk about the water issues that we've been working on. Uh, before I get going, I would like to acknowledge that we have most of the members of the Water Commission with us here today. So um, we've been working on these issues with them pretty much in a very intense way over about the last eight, 10 months. And um, I'd like to make sure that during the, your conversations that you have an opportunity to hear from them as we go through. So um, I hope that will be feasible. And I know they're not shy, so they'll be raising their hand. And, and we have made them panelists so that they can participate in that kind of part of the conversation. And then we also have uh, with us a number of people from the Water Department staff. So, um, you know, there may be that at some point in this presentation, I'll ask some folks to um, make additional comments or, you know, provide some color commentary on uh, some topic that is specific to something you're interested in. And then finally, I have with us today Sanjay Gar, who's our um, consultant for a lot of the uh, rate making work that we're doing. And he will actually share with me a couple of the elements of the, of the uh, presentation, particularly related to cost of service analysis and then to the water pricing objectives work that um, many of you provided me with input for. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get going, and I'd like to make this kind of a, a, as informal as possible. I know this is a, it's a formalized meeting and we are doing a presentation. We do have a number of action items or areas that we want um, for you to give us some input on. 
Um, I, I'd like to sort of do this presentation in a way that allows for there to be a break. Uh, there's there topics here, they're all related to each other, but there's still quite a bit of content. So if uh, I will go through this and then uh, stop occasionally, see if there's questions, uh, see if the water commissioners would like to make comments on various things, and then uh, move on when you're ready. I, I'm, I've noted in the presentation a number of places where there's an action item requested of you. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you take the action item when I get there, but I'm sort of reminding us all that those are the items that we would like to get some feedback from you on. Great. So with that, I'm going to launch into um, this presentation, and I hope to do it in a way that makes it understandable to you and to those members of the community who are watching. So to start with, I want to talk about uh, utility financial planning. Uh, this is relevant to us because we're basically a self-funded business in your, you know, we're a utility that only has water rate revenues and fees and charges as the source of our uh, resources. So we do financial planning kind of uh, the way the whole city might do the financial planning or any kind of a business or other kind of private sector utility would do financial planning, which is we look at our, you know, what we need and we try to set our prices to make sure that we were cover what our costs are and, and be able to meet our financial obligations. This is the, uh, the financial planning conceptual model we use, and there are a number of really key elements here that, that are outputs, the long-range uh, financial plan, which we have one from 2016 that we'll be updating this year, and then proposed rates. Those are key outputs of what, of what we're doing, but there are a lot of really important inputs to these things uh, that each one of them that I think are important for you to understand. We're not doing asking you to make make decisions on really any of these elements today, but I think it's really important as we go forward into the work we're doing over the next, say, six, nine months on rate making that you have a sense of, you know, what the process is and, and what are the legally required inputs, what are the ones we're using because we want to make sure that we're, you know, um, aligning ourselves with community goals, that kind of thing. So I'm going to quick go through uh, the financial plan inputs and uh, talk a little bit about those. And then we're going to talk about uh, revenue requirements. And then we're going to talk some more about some of these other elements of um, the elements of inputs into the water rate making. That's kind of, this is this is your touchstone to go back to and say, what is she talking about? Which, how does that relate to something that's on here? And almost all of it is related to something that's specifically on this uh, slide. So we do have uh, inputs to the financial plan, our reserves um, and debt service coverage ratio. These are financial policies and then uh, revenue requirements where we have to give operating costs in our capital program, the CIP uh, inputs and, to, and not just for one year, but typically we do this for five years. So it's a five year forward looking analysis. The reserves and the uh, financial uh, policies we have from the 2016 plan that this is, these are our reserve level, levels, 180 days of operating cash, $10 million in rate stabilization reserve, $3 million in a emergency reserve, and then 1.5 debt service times debt service coverage. What debt service coverage means that if you have a $2 million annual debt payment, you have to have net revenues at the end of your uh, fiscal year of $3 million so that the banks and the people who loan you money can be sure that you're going to be able to pay the debt service. So it's like if your mortgage was, you know, $1,000, in order to meet the one and a half times debt service coverage, you'd have to make sure that every month you have uh, $1,500 in your bank account. And this is an important issue because it helps to drive how much revenue we have to produce. And as we're debt financing a lot of our capital, our debt amount, how much debt service we're going to carry uh, each year is going to increase over time. 
I've, I've uh, included this chart uh, and it's very busy and I will make these slides available to you later. But the reason that, that the financial policies are so important have to do with the credit rating. We, uh, the Water Department has its own credit rating and issues debt that's backed by our, um, by our revenues that we generate. And all of these items on this piece of paper, which there won't be a test on later, uh, really help, uh, help to see when someone is looking at our, our uh, credit worthiness, what kinds of issues they, they take a look at. So things that are in the community, like the unemployment rate of the, of the community, um, the annual utility bill as a percent of median household income, these are sort of characteristics that might be community-based. Clearly, the financial strength having to do with days cash on hand, operating revenues, uh, the debt service coverage, those kinds of things are really important from a financial strength. They look at your, our ability to manage and whether we're in compliance with regulations, and then there are legal provisions as well. Um, so I think just to wrap up the, the sort of uh, 2016 uh, long range financial plan, kind of where we are, we, we've made a lot of significant accomplishments since the end of, uh, since having that plan adopted in June of 2016. And that includes that we funded all of our reserves by 2019. So we are carrying 180 days of cash. We do have a, at the, in 2018, 2019, we had 10 million in the rate stabilization reserve. We had a $3.1 million um, uh, emergency reserve, and it was a darn good thing because in 2020 we used some of those reserves to address, you know, various kinds of emergencies, uh, including uh, the, the pandemic, floods, fire, and you know, it really helped us to have some of those resources available so that we could make good decisions over time. And we maintained our strong financial position in spite of these many challenges. So, and, and then finally, you know, in terms of the, the 2016 LR, uh, Long Range Financial Plan was designed to help us begin the capital reinvestment process that we have actually funded and are working to implement now. So we've made substantial progress, not only on the planning work associated with that, but a number of the projects that were on that list, the early ones have been, you know, put out to bid and they're in construction or they've been, they're completed. So I think that's a really, you know, that, that plan has stood us in good stead, stead and I think going forward, we'll be bringing you an updated plan uh, in the next few months. A really important element for um, the, the rate making process and thinking about financial planning is what your revenue requirements are. And this is one where we've also done a lot of good work in the last number of years. Um, the, knowing that the operating costs were one thing and they're somewhat more predictable because we inflate them at a kind of you know modest rate over time to represent the cost of benefits and the cost of salaries and the cost of chemicals and the cost of power um, we we know that those things are they're somewhat more predictable than the cost of our capital program so we did a lot of work in the last six months looking at revenue requirements particularly focused on CIP spending and trying to really understand from the CIP uh, projections what kind of revenue increases we would be uh, likely facing if we did various kinds of capital programs. And so that's what this next little section is gonna talk to you about. Um, and then I'm gonna give the water commissioners a chance to, to participate in this process and also that made this recommendation to you, um, give them a little bit of a chance to talk. So we, we had an ad hoc subcommittee. They, they got to understand our financial model. We developed a, a range of uh, future CIP scenarios, which I'm gonna talk to you about briefly. And then they asked us to develop and analyze an additional scenario, which we did, and came up with a recommendation. So this is the, uh, the element that is our, um, our operating cost. And you can see that 2022 is lower than 2021. It's that way because we worked with our managers to ask them to really you know, sharpen their pencils and look at a way to um, 
see if they could set the 2022 budget based on 2020 actuals. And they did that by and large. There's some inflation in here, but this is about 8% lower than 22 or than 21. So our operating budget, we've made a, an effort to really, you know, try to tighten that one, that up as best we could as we go forward. And then with respect to the Santa Cruz water program and the capital program, you might recall that we have three basic elements, renewed diversions, pipelines and pumps, uh, the coast pump station project that was affecting the property at 2020 or 1220 River Street is just recently completed. You're gonna have a notice of completion of that project on your agenda next week. Um, we're obviously working at the, um, at the, uh, the Newell Creek Dam on the issues related to the pipeline that goes through that dam, the inlet outlet structure, and replacing that pipeline. We've got work that's going on at our treatment plant, uh, a big project getting under construction uh, later this month that is uh, a multi-year project, $45 million uh, concrete tanks replacement, and then a project that is going forward under design build, progressive design build strategy that is for rehabilitation of the water treatment plant and then supply augmentation uh, work that's also going on simultaneously. So this is a lot. There's no doubt about it that this is a major effort to reinvest in our community and our community's water system infrastructure and assets. And it's not free. It's expensive as all get out. So the scenarios that we worked on with the Water Commission's group were sort of a small, medium, and large, if you will. Um, the, the smallest one was just complete the work we have currently underway and some planning work. So you don't get any investments in water supply or treatment upgrades. Um, it has an $189 price tag. It requires a 7%, an estimated 7% year over year annual rate revenue increase, not rate increase because revenue increases get distributed out so in a different way. So there, it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, but it's an annual year over year revenue increase in order to fund that program. And most of the spending would be done by uh, fiscal 25, which is not that far away. Scenario two uh, funded the active projects, treatment upgrades at Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant and then some supply projects. It has a 10-year cost of, a, of 377 million. It requires a 10-year year-over-year increase in revenues. And the spending declined after 2028, fiscal 2028. And then the current baseline CIP, the sort of this is what we need to do uh, list, um, is a project that involves 610 million. It's a very large number over 10 years. It would require a 14% year over year um, increase in revenues and spending would go till 2030, fiscal 2030. So this is the, these are the, the projects that the, um, the ad hoc subcommittee looked at and they're sort of, as they went through that process, these are sort of the things that they um, considered, which was, um, you know, it's kind of this question of what are we, what are we buying with this, these resources? We have infrastructure reliability and improvements versus if we don't make investments, do we have degradation and further failures? That's, that's, you know, if you have a car and it needs repair and you don't make the repairs to it, you know, you can't expect the car to provide the same level of reliable service that it might have done historically. Um, one of the other factors they talked about was the continued vulnerability to, dr to drought resulting from deferring supply augmentation projects. It's a, you know, clearly here we are, we're at a, we're in another year where it's been really, really dry and we're seeing how vulnerable we are to these, um, you know, climate change driven weather patterns that we're seeing. Um, we know that just like in a, you know, if you have a leaky roof in your house and it starts to really rain and you don't want everything in your house to be ruined, you have an emergency repair and it's not cheaper, it, 
it, you know, there, and if you don't really deal with the roof problem, then, you know, you can accumulate quite a bit of spending on any kind of emergency repairs for pipeline failures or other infrastructure failures. And this is not, you know, it's not, if it's not a planned expense, it doesn't mean it's not an expense. So when in reviewing these and sort of the value proposition associated with each one of the uh, alternatives, the ad hoc subcommittee asked us to develop a fourth scenario that extended the schedule from 10 years to 15, 16 years, and to sort of smooth out the cost over a longer period of time, which is what we did. And that turns out to be uh, 653 million because these are all inflated dollars, so the longer it goes out, the bigger the cost is. Um, it requires a 10% year-over-year rate increase, um, so it's sort of the same as um, option two that we talked about a minute ago. Some of the projects, these are some of the projects that would get pushed back a little bit in order to sort of smooth this out. So the recommendation for revenue requirements is this plan associated with our, also with our operating costs for the next five years. And this is a important input for us to use in rate making. And so that is, um, this is the sort of graphic that shows the, you know, the, the um, cumulative of dollar amounts and I apologize, I didn't, I should have talked about this before and the, and the spending patterns for the three options. Um, so one of the actions we're asking you to do today is to authorize us to use the Water Commission recommended revenue requirements in rate development. It doesn't commit you to whatever comes from that, but it's kind of saying, you know, we need to use something. This is the plan we need to, we want to work with, and we want to then bring you the proposed rates associated with that. I'm going to stop here and maybe, um, Donna, if you want to, um, if you want to see if the, any water commissioners want to raise their hands and make comments here. Yeah, that's great. If there's any water commissioners at the meeting that would like to make any comments regarding where we are right now in the presentation, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, Sierra Ryan, go ahead, Sierra, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I, I see Doug has his hand up too, and I think he'd be, he was on the subcommittee who worked so hard to bring this to the commission, but um, I just wanted to let you know that as someone who is the commissioner, we heard this presentation um, a, a couple months back, and you know, it, it, it is a lot of money, and we acknowledge that, um, but we spent a lot of time discussing that we really felt like these were things that we, we cannot put this off anymore. Part of the reason it's so expensive is because things were put off in the past and, and we can't continue to do that. And we're seeing the impacts um, and we have seen in other parts of the country what can happen if you, if you don't invest in your infrastructure and it fails you in a catastrophic way. Um, it's something that, well, it is, it's going to be a, a lift for the community. I think people will understand that it is something that just has to be done. And we did take into account um, that this is going to be challenging for some people and there are some equity issues that we're continuing to discuss and we'll be discussing through some of the rate making pro pro um, process as we move forward with that. But um, I do wanna say that as, um, as the chair of the Water Commission, we all really did support the work of um, of this subcommittee and this um, plan that they came up with. We really felt like they did a lot of really thorough due diligence and that we really felt like we didn't have many, really have a good other option. Like this is this is the path that we felt the most comfortable going down. Um, so thank you for considering. Thank you, Sierra. Uh, Doug Inkfors next and then Alejandra. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Myers. And um, building on what Sierra had to say as a, as a member of the subcommittee, I can reflect a little bit on some of the thought process we went through. I guess for me, this all, uh, as big a bite as it is to propose obligating the city to this kind of an expense uh, over the coming years, I really do see it as 
uh, converting a, necess a necessity into a virtue. Um, you know, this is work that we have to do pretty much across the board, uh, particularly as relates to the condition of the system as it exists today and ensuring that our future supplies are reliable and resilient, um, able to serve the community uh, in, in the face of climate change. What got me over the hump was the recognition that, uh, particularly now with historically low interest rates, it, 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 there are actually some good generational equities in financing this rather than trying to do everything on a pay-go basis. This has been historically our approach, and that is the folks, um, us, our kids, our grandkids who are going to enjoy the benefits of this are, are going to be um, the ones who will be paying for it as it's financed over an extended period of time. Um, and I, I also want to commend staff for the engagement and flexibility they brought to the conversations we had. Uh, we looked at some alternative financing scenarios and things like that. And some of the ones I brought up were probably kind of harebrained, but staff uh, entertained them anyway and modeled them out. Um, and we came to, to this recommendation um, with which we feel quite comfortable. So I hope it, uh, hope it meets, your, um, meets your expectations. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. And uh, Commissioner Paramo, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, my name is Alejandro, and I was also on the ad hoc committee alongside Doug Angfer and Walt Waldlow. Um, I won't repeat some of the things already mentioned, um, but I'll say that um, we were certainly um, thorough in our process in meeting with uh, water department staff and worked together over the course of around five meetings through the fall and through the spring as we were looking and assessing the different scenarios. Um, I was grateful that through that process and we tried to work through different scenarios and not just the ones that were presented as the three that we had initially looked at and went out to the fourth scenario to try and smooth out the potential spend uh, and revenue requirements over the longer period of time. Uh, and the result of that analysis, I think, um, led to a rate increase that was at least a bit lower than what was initially um, played out into that scenario three while accomplishing everything that would be part of the current CIP. Um, and uh, echoing what Doug said around, you know, going towards system resilience and system reliability and building out for the future, it's certainly a large expense, uh, but an investment that would uh, reap dividends over the period of time. Um, one comment and thing I'd mention, when we're looking through the modeling scenarios, there is also no inclusion of any sort of grant funding or assumptions of potential grant funding that could potentially come into play. Um, it's possible that you know there could be potential sources that can augment some of the revenue increases or what could there be through grant funding. But the modeling that we looked at and the results that outputted um, assumed for no grant grant funding in the scenarios. So just wanted to comment on that. It was something that I was. Uh, asking about and looking into when we're assessing the situation and the scenarios um, and thought it was worth sharing here as well. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Is there any um, other water commissioners this afternoon that would like to comment right now at this point? And then I have a question. Uh, uh, Councilmember Brown, do you have a question or comment? Uh, yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask if even if folks uh, from the Water Commission, if you don't have a comment, it would be great to just hear uh, who you are and who's here. You put in a lot of work and uh, all volunteer time and, and really do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So it'd be great to just at some point do that. Thank you. Right. Um, that, that would be great. You've heard from three, and I think we only have six here today. The other three that you didn't hear from are Walt Wadlow, uh, who's been on the commission for, this is his last year out of 10, so um, he's been a really wonderful asset to have as a, a participant in this group. Um, and then we have two new commissioners. We have Tom Burns, who's representing the outside city ratepayers, and then we also have Justin Burks, who joined our commission. Those two joined our commission in February. So. So those are the, the six, and the one who's not here happens to be on Guam right now doing some work, and his name is Doug Schwarm. So thank you for asking that, uh, Councilmember Brown. Okay, um, Rosemary, you're gonna we're gonna come back to these individual actions, so we'll take yeah. detailed questions later. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. 
So moving along, I wanted to give just a couple, uh, there's, there's several inputs to rate making. One of them is how much water are you gonna sell? And so this is an important question. When we had to make this choice in 2016, it was pretty hard because we just reduced demand for um, water, water through restrictions in 2014 and 2015. I had no idea, I made a guess. It seemed like it was really low, but turned out it was like not that low. So we, we've recently updated our water demand forecast and that uh, forecast has, um, has resulted in, sorry, I'm gonna hide this, okay. Um, has resulted in uh, an update to the long-term demand forecast that goes out to 2045 that pretty much takes the current demand at about uh, 2.4 billion gallons a year and shows an increase of up to about 2.7 billion gallons a year uh, by 2045. You'll see that there's a fairly good sized chunk of increase that, that's happening in the 2020 to 2025 uh, time frame. I've looked at the data. It's that's driven mostly by house, in, increments of housing, as opposed to uh, there's some population growth, but the big chunk of of that's driven by uh, increments of housing. And not surprisingly, the forecast is a little bit more certain in the very near term compared to the further out years. So uh, I think that that this data all comes from. Uh, Association of Metropolitan uh, or Bay or Monterey Bay uh, Air Government, so AMBAG. Um, and uh, so, so I think that, that this forecast kind of tells us what we've seen over the last several years is kind of what we're gonna see for the next two and a half decades. And I think that that's not a big surprise given the fact that um, you know, we have a very conserving population. We do have some uh, population growth and we have some growth in things like the university that's proposed. I'm not saying that that's supported necessarily is gonna happen, but it's in here. The, the LRDP, the university's LRDP demand is in this forecast and it's very flat in the, um, in the next couple decades. Um, and then we're seeing, um, I just wanted you to see this graphic, which is, this is the forecast from 2015. Uh, it assumed we would go from, you know, a, a restricted area back to about 3.4 billion gallons a year and then slightly decline to about, uh, you know, with some additional sort of growth and development going on in this time frame, but conservation and building codes and, and price elasticity of demand would, generate a kind of a flattening of that curve in the last 20 years of the time frame. And this demand forecast is, you know, 20, 30% lower than that and pretty flat over the, the coming uh, number of years. So in the, in the assumptions we'll be using this, uh, about how much water we're gonna sell, we'll be using this data uh, for those assumptions. And then I wanna, uh, another element is under Prop 218, we're required to base our rates on a cost of service analysis. And for this element of the presentation, I'm gonna ask Sanjay Gar, our, our um, consultant from Raptelis, to do this part of the presentation because he's an expert at it and I think he'll, um, he'll be able to answer your questions and sort of talk you through what the, any, any questions or issues you might have. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Sanjay. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, Mayor, council member, city council public, um, my pleasure to meet with you today and to talk to you about cost of service. Um, we do cost of service for a couple of reasons, um, as Rosemary mentioned. First, um, let me just step back just to make sure we're all on the same page. So as Rosemary talked about, she talked about the financial needs of the agency of the water utility, and it's basically about how much revenue we need to collect on an annual basis to cover operating costs, CIP. Um, the second part of the is basically how to allocate that cost, who should pay for what, and what's the appropriate share of cost. Um, and that's what the cost of service is about. It's basically about slicing the pie or 
creating pizza, um, slices of pizza in some sense. And the reason why we do that is because people use the system differently. And here's an example of two um, systems. You can also think of as two different customers. Um, you have system one, system two. And as you can see, system two has this high use in the summertime, while system one uses the water relatively the same throughout the year. And if you think about the infrastructure that's needed to provide that water service, system two would need larger facilities. They would need larger pipes, storage, pumping, and all those larger facilities, of course, cost additional money. And so the goal here with cost of service is to ask ourselves which of our customers are sort of using the system uh, more so maybe in the summertime, not necessarily in the wintertime, um, and that seasonality, and who should be paying for that. And we do this analysis, this cost of service analysis first, it's equitable, we wanna make sure everyone pays its fair share. Um, we also do it, as Rosemary mentioned, because of Prop 218. Um, Prop 218, a voter initiative, and there's been a series of court cases associated with it, which basically says that there needs to be a nexus between our cost structure of running the water utility and the rate. So a simpler way of thinking of it um, is that rates shouldn't be arbitrary or capricious. There should be a logic and rationality with our rate structure. So end of the day, by the time we're done with the study, we have a rate structure that makes sense for your community. It also embraces the values of your community, so we can do that too. But there are some constraints, and I'll be talking about that. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, different customers um, use the system differently. Um, you do have different cu customers. For instance, you have UCSC as one example. You have North Coast Ag as another example. Um, you all, um, Rosemary will be talking about the elevation charge um, and also inside outside customers. Um, so there's different customers in your system that use the system differently and we should have a rationality for how they use that system. Um, we look at the, the cost of running the utility, the cost structure, we look at how people use the system and we marry the two together. The main thing though um, is that each group has to pay its own way. We can't have any subsidies allowed. And this is a constraint with Prop 218, unfortunately, that um, because of maybe we want to have rates sort of lower for certain social economic groups of our customers, uh, which may be warranted, um, because of Prop 218, we can't use rates to do that. So each rate customer class has to pay for its fair share. Um, so that's the constraint with Prop 218. So what we do is, is um, Rosemary, and if you click the next slide, we have a little animation there. Um, so basically we have, we know how much revenue we want to collect, that's the revenue requirement, that's the annual basis, everyone was very mentioned. And then we start looking and I ask ourselves, what's the cost of the supply? You don't purchase water, you have it. Um, but there is some cost associated with that, minor. There's some base cost, that's the meet average demand. There's peaking cost, that's the additional cost that's needed for the summertime. Um, and your service area is that much, um, people don't use that much water as we know during the summer, but there is some additional capacity. There's meter maintenance, cost to maintain the meter, customer service to issue the bill, and then also fire protection as we know, which is important. So we wanna identify all these cost structures. Then we go to the next slide. And then we start allocating these cost structures to each customer based on a rationality, based on either demand, based on the meter size, uh, based on issuing a bill, or based on actual peaking or capacity. So we go through a, a methodology and a logic where then we know what each customer should pay and their fair share of their cost. And we can go, I think that's it for me, right? Yeah. Robert? Back to you. Right, so um, before uh, Sanjay signs off, any questions about the cost of service? This is done backward looking using a base year, in our case with uh, fiscal 19, and then the proportions that get established for all these costs get used in forward looking projections uh, based on the, so, so that if you used, if a customer used 10% of the um, base cost in 2019, then they're gonna pay 10% of what the base costs need to be kind of going forward in the, in the years uh, that we're projecting costs for. I have a um, quick question, Rosemary. Um, you mentioned that this was done sort of following, you know, what would require, be required under 218. Does that, does the law require that too if you're just looking at rate changes for your customer base then? I mean, I'm just 
curious. I, it's a good analysis to do anyways, because obviously you, we want to understand how to communicate cost of service right. to every payer, every uh, rate payer. But I'm just curious about whether that's legally re required versus a 218 where you have to show that benefit assessment. Yeah, I, I will answer it the way I think, and then Tony, Kandati, or uh, Sanjay, you can add. Um, basically, you have to be able to demonstrate that whatever rates you have in place reflect the cost of service. Right. And if you can do that in some way that doesn't require this kind of detailed analysis, that's fine. But the standard that seems to have been set is this level of analysis. Okay, great. Thank you. Tony or... Sanjay, anything to add? I guess I would just say that um, the courts in case law over the years have seemed to have uh, adopted a more and more refined or required more and more refined analysis to accurately attribute costs um, to the properties that are being served. And so this type of analysis um, could have been done with a little bit more general assumptions and guesswork in the years past, and the courts have really been trying, have really been taking closer look at how uh, rates are structured uh, under the requirements of Prop 218. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what's next on, uh, in terms of the water rate development process? So we're going to talk a little bit more further down the, in the agenda tonight about finalizing the water pricing objectives, because this is sort of like, what policies do we want the rates to, to uh, reflect? We can create rates that meet the cost of service analysis and still achieve or work to achieve some of the policy objectives that, that those of you who looked at the, the pricing objectives, you saw that there's a whole variety of different, you know, outcomes you can try to, um, you can try to evaluate. Identify and evaluate uh, rate structures, alternatives, and that work is going on right now. We're gonna be bringing some stuff to the Water Commission uh, next month to kind of talk about some alternative rate structures and what they might look like very preliminarily, and then uh, rate proposals for council review and ultimately public review through the Prop 218 notification process, public hearing, the time frame for these things are probably uh, the, the 218 authorization process to go ahead and do the notification is uh, late August and um, the, the rates would be coming back for public hearing and council action in late October, kind of roughly. Okay. Um, the next, since we've been talking about rates, I wanted to share with you today some work that we've been doing on affordability because it's a really big issue for me. I think we've talked about this a couple of times uh, in earlier sessions that uh, where the Water Department has been presenting information to the council on one thing or another. And I wanted to share with you today some issues related to affordability uh, and the analysis that's been completed and a conversation we've been having at the Water Commission about an alternative to possibly explore, and that's a question we're asking for your input on today. So the, the motivation for the study that we've done is that, you know, water and sewer system costs have been and, and will be increasing because of capital requirements and to some degree, you know, operating costs, but largely driven by capital. Uh, we know that many, and the income levels of many households are not rising at the same light rate that we're increasing the rate. So we know that's a mismatch. And there are, there's very strong both nationally and certainly in California emphasis right now on water service affordability. And, you know, we have things like the AB 685, which is the human rights to water uh, piece of legislation that the state has adopted. And an effort in uh, 2015, I believe, to look at low income water rate assistance programs and to try to see an assessment of what it would cost the city to create some kind of a safety net program for water rate payers, not just in Santa Cruz, but around the whole state. And so we know that this is a big issue. This morning I did a, a webinar with a member of the um, Senate Environment and Public Works Committee about affordability, water affordability issues. And I shared this analysis and talked about our capital program what's driving our costs. And they are, the feds are looking also at a, um, 
at a, you know, some kind of a way to address this issue because it's really become clear through the pandemic and before really that, the, uh, you know, equitable access to water is a public health issue in our in our country. And we need to be able to have people have equitable access. And the current business model that we operate under, which is all this stuff has to be funded locally, gets in the way of us being able to achieve that outcome, which is really important. So I have asked the, um, the David Mitchell, who's the same person who we, we work with on our water uh, demand forecasting to do an analysis for me. It did the first one in 2016 after the last rate increases. It was much less granular than this one. Um, but I've asked him to sort of update that given our current rate structure, and then once we get sort of proposed rates to update it again, kind of looking out five years to see how, how things might change over that period of time. So the, we did a, a approach that looked at very disaggregated information. It's on the census block group basis, looking at essential indoor use. That's what IEIU -E stands for, it's, and it's wintertime consumption, basically. Uh, uses a median disposable income that's created by taking median household uh, income in each census block group, subtracting median housing costs, so we get a disposable income, and then dividing the water or water and sewer bill by that, and there's some metrics that we can uh, talk about there. Um, Looking at poverty prevalence as a, another factor, and you'll see a, a sort of a burden, financial burden matrix that, that we'll show you here uh, down the road. And then um, to create a, a, a score for each, you know, each census block group. These are the census block groups, and the numbers in these census blocks are the number of housing units, including, they include the multifamily as well as single family. Uh, and so this is all in the water service area, so it includes Santa Cruz plus the areas outside the city that we serve. And uh, mention what, how the strategy has worked. Uh, water bill for essential indoor use using February consumption divided by household income minus household, uh, median household income for the census block, median housing cost for that census block that then becomes a quote unquote a surrogate for disposable income and same for water and sewer. And this is the, these are the metrics. It's, these are longstanding metrics that exist in, that came out of EPA a long time ago when these numbers were, oh my God, they're, they, we could never get that high. 2% um, median household income for sewer service, 2.5% for water service, or 4.5% combined. There's a lot of talk about it, these are right metrics, but because we got this to disposable income instead of you know just median household income, um, this, these metrics seem to make some sense at least to use as a place to start. And this, there's a series of these, um, these maps in the, in the staff report and in the and more in the document I provided that kind of give you a sense of where things stand at the moment and you will see that um, you know, what, sorry, this thing is in the wrong place. I have to move you all over to the other side of my screen. <laughs> um, you know, 86% of the households are, um, have under four and a half percent. We still have about 5,000 households that have more than four and a half percent of their um, disposable income is based on uh, you know, is, is being spent on um, utilities, water and sewer. Um, this is a, an attempt to sort of try to create a financial burden matrix. So taking that water and sewer cost per, you know, per census block versus the, looking at the census blocks where they have a, what percent of each of the households in each census block is making incomes less than 200% of the federal poverty level, um, creates a, uh, you know, two parts of a, um, a sort of a matrix that then you can plot the, the pieces against. And that's what produces this, this graphic. So when you're looking at a low um, number of households in the census block group, that have uh, you know less than 
200% of the federal poverty level and people paying less than 1.5% for combined water and sewer, that's a low financial burden versus down here where you've got, you know, more than 50% in a census block group that's, that has uh, more than 50% of the households in the census block group have incomes that are less than 200% of the federal poverty level and they're paying more than 4.5% of their uh, household income, median, the disposable income, that's a high, an area with a high burden. And that, this uh, analysis produces this figure, which shows that, you know, in general, 80, 75, 80% are kind of in the moderate or lower, but we do have, you know, six or 7,000 households in our area, and these probably aren't surprising areas to see called out on this graphic um, where, you know, we have high financial burdens. This area over here in Live Oak, for some of you might not be familiar with it, is, is um, there are a lot of mobile homes in this particular area, and actually all, quite along this whole sort of corridor in the, in the Live Oak area that seem to be contributing to some degree to, you know, what we're seeing in, in this, these designations. I have a question, Rosemary. When you use this, um, I can't help but notice some of the area on the on the far left would be, I would assume, probably some student housing. So how do you measure that kind of resident if they show up in the census? I mean, they obviously are, have, would have a hard time, but if you know, how do you how do you factor in whether their parents are paying for their rent? You know, all of that. How does that transform that? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big question, and and we've had conversations. Uh, Lee Butler and I, when this data first came in and these results first came in, you know, spent a long time sort of staring at this and kind of saying, what do we think is going on over here? And you know, are these are these uh, census block groups over here particularly heavily, typically heavily populated by students? Uh, you know, lots of rentals there that relate to the university, maybe, maybe not. Um, what I would tell you is that, you know, it could very well be that the students don't report income under, this is under the, Amer the data mostly comes for the income stuff and that comes from American Community Survey and that, that's updated. So it could very well, they, they're not reporting income, but doesn't necessarily mean they don't have income. Um, and that's not something that we can get at with this particular uh, analysis because the data sources don't, don't tell us that. We would have to do something, you know, like go into one of these areas and try to do more of a house to house or some kind of other survey that would help us understand what might be going on there. Okay. But I think that we, we do know and we can see some places in the, uh, where there are challenges that sort of line up with what we would think. Uh, this is the sort of River Street, yeah. Uh, the, you know, the Ocean Street, Upper Ocean, uh, sort of Upper River area that sort of seem like that those are areas that someone asked me, is there a problem there? I might nod my head and say, it looks yeah, good. that seems likely to me. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that the, what I would say kind of in the, the conclusions of this current, you know, the analysis of current conditions is that you know, water and sewer service today is affordable for most households. But we all, we do know that there are um, households that are already struggling. And we know that as we go forward, you know, and raise water rate increases and sewer rate increases uh, as a result of, you know, need for capital reinvestment, that this is going to be an increasing issue in our community. One, one comment I would make about what we're seeing here, there's a, there's a designation called disadvantaged communities that's um, the, the particularly related to water service. I don't know that that definition that I'm thinking of applies more broadly, but there is a definition that, um, that is applied statewide to areas that are, um, that are struggling with water service and affordability. With the exception of beach flats, we don't have 
disadvantaged community, designated disadvantaged communities in Santa Cruz. And it's not because we don't have people who can't afford to pay. It's that they don't all live clustered in the same, you know, concentrated area. Mm -hmm. So there's an issue there with the way that definition is used. And, you know, you will often see, uh, I think with SB 200 that was passed last year that, you know, puts $130 million available for communities that are disadvantaged communities, largely mainly in the Central Valley, that are struggling with, uh, you know, providing adequate water service to their, to their customers, to their population. Those are disadvantaged communities where that money is funneling. But in general, Santa Cruz wouldn't qualify for any of that because we don't meet the definition, the, the classic definitions that have been used in determining. And you will see this in, you know, the rescue bill, the, the COVID rescue bill that the federal came out recently, and certainly the the um, the Biden jobs uh, proposal, the the big you know infrastructure thing that has disadvantaged communities are high on the list, but. In general, we don't qualify for that in, in the classic way of thinking about these problems. Um, in the paper, in the staff report, the, there is an item, and I, and I didn't put any slides in about this, but I wanted to, to mention it here because it's a decision that we are going to be asking you for feedback about. The Water Commission and the Water Department staff have been talking about a strategy for, pay, for thinking about separating out the capital costs that are really driving the rate increases we're, we're looking at and putting those onto the tax bill as a, a, a fixed fee that would go onto the property tax. One of the things that would do is stabilize the rate, uh, the, the monthly bills, because you would then just have the monthly bills recovering the capital or the operating costs. And it doesn't make the costs associated with the capital go away. And if you're a property owner, it certainly doesn't make it, you know, you're going to pay over in your property tax and then you're going to pay your monthly uh, water utility bill or what, you know, if you're getting a, a combined bill, you're going to pay that. But it does seem as though for there, that there may well be a way to, you know, justify that as a way of thinking about how to make more make water service more affordable to um, a general purpose, you know, rate payer. And, you know, we're asking for you to give us some feedback on whether or not you want us to pursue this idea in developing rate proposals. Um, I'm gonna stop here for a second and see if there are questions and also maybe, um, Mayor, to see if uh, water commissioners or other council members want to ask questions, not make comments. I am not seeing any hands from either commissioners or uh, council members. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead then. Keep going, yeah. Um, oh, all right. Sorry, uh, oh. Council member Cummings just raised his hand. Sorry, I was... I was trying to finish taking notes and I, I lost my voice. Um, so if you can't hear me, I'll try to repeat myself. Um, I guess one of the questions that's come up and that's been a concern is, you know, if if um, this cost is put on, pushed to the property tax bills, how that might impact um, many of the rental homes in the community because ultimately that cost is just gonna get pushed on to the renters. And so is there any, I guess, it seems like either it goes on to the rate payer who lives in the unit, or if it goes to the property tax, and that can yeah. also be pushed on to the, the rate payer. So I don't know if there's been any thoughts or discussion around that and well, why this is a better option than another. Yeah, well, we don't have very many options. That's one, one reason why it's maybe an option. I think the other thing that we were talking about is that until fairly recently, state and local taxes, of which this would, if this is part of your property tax bill, which is as if you live outside the, the city limits, you're paying your wastewater already on your state and local taxes. That those used to be deductible on your federal income tax as a, you know, it didn't mean that they were, like no one gave you a tax credit for it, but it was still, a, you know, made a change to your adjusted gross income, right? So, it, 
and parts of it still are, but not as not the whole thing that used to be um, a while ago. But arguably, if the property owner were you know in a position where that kind of write-off would happen, it wouldn't be a one, necessarily be a one-on-one -on -one transfer of these costs. And that's the other piece of it. And I don't think it's a, I think it has the benefit of stabilizing the, the monthly bill. And many renters do pay the monthly bill, even though they would, and so I think that's, that's the biggest benefit. I think that it's one of the few things we can do, and you can make the case that it's the property owner who's really benefiting from the reinvestment in the system. It's not a perfect solution, and you know there aren't very many utilities that have done it. And and I don't know whether it's the right thing for us to do or not, but it certainly is something that we're asking. Do you want us to consider it? Because there seems to be some nuggets here or there that might make it worth considering. Yeah, I guess just to follow up, it also seems like if it just a thought based on this conversation is that if it. You know, if you have even, for example, you have properties that sit vacant, they might not be consuming that water. But if it's tied to that property tax, it, those individuals are still responsible for um, kind of helping to invest in the water infrastructure, which everybody needs. So yeah. that's, that's another positive way of looking at it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm moving. I'm going ahead and moving forward. So. One of the things we ask you to do, and we certainly did this with the Water Commission also, was to look at water pricing objectives. And so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna turn this back over to um, our consultant, Sanjay Gar, to, to talk about this because we did get some input from you and we also had some input from the Water Commission and what we'd like to do is sort of uh, summarize that and uh, and then, you know, at some point when we get past the, a few more things to go here, but not that many. Um, we can talk about, you know, are these the ones that you want to have us begin to think about using and shaping uh, actual rate structures? So, ready for me to go ahead, Sanjay? Yes. So, as Rosemary mentioned, um, we want to do a pricing objective. So, in this whole process, you know, we figure out the revenue, we do the cost of service, we meet Prop 218 requirements. But even within Prop 218, there is a little wiggle room we have where we can meet the goals and objectives of your community and, and embrace the values that you have. And so, that's the purpose of this rank, of this pricing objective. Um, we asked you to fill it out, and um, thank you for doing that. Um, the Water Commission did that, and you did that too. And what we want to do when we look at this is we first want to understand what are our goals, what are our values of our community, what makes sense, um, and so that we have a rate structure that reflects that within still the, the bounds of Prop 218. And, and then we want to look at the business case, especially if we're looking at some kind of alternative rate structure in the sense that does it require new um, um, billing system, staff, you know, especially those that are a little bit more um, potentially have more administrative costs associated with it. And then the last thing, of course, we want to understand is the customer impact. So, you know, whenever you change rates, rate structure, cost of service is a zero sum game because if someone sees a reduction, that means someone else must see an increase because we're still trying to collect the same amount of revenue. Um, so we want to understand those impacts and who are we affecting so we have a good understanding of that. Next slide. So these are some standard pricing objectives that we used. Um, we asked you to rank them um, to see what makes sense in, in your community. Um, and based on those ranks that we got, both from the Water Commission and from the city, from you, from City Council, we examined them. And actually, Rosemary and I looked at them. And we compared notes and see what well, what are the themes. And we did see some themes. So the next slide. Um, basically, and it was interesting that we found these, um, they're very similar, these three themes that the um, Water Commission and the City Council said that um, some minor nuances, but basically to ensure water uh, for essential use is affordable and accessible. Um, so that's one thing that was very clear. Second was is that we want to make sure we have the revenues available and stable to meet operating capital and customer service levels. <laughs> 
And then the lastly, we want to uh, maintain transparency and equitable for water, capital and water reliability. Um, those were three um, themes that uh, I clearly saw, both from the Water Commission and uh, from City Council. Um, another um, concern that city staff had was is that given resources limitation, that administrative ease should be important. That wasn't as important, but that's important for the staff. So we want to design a rate structure that meets those three needs. That's my challenge <laughs> um, in, in doing that. And um, so I'll, I'll work with you on that. And those are some of the options, and that's why Rosemary brought up the property tax um, because it does, you know, as you can see, some of these sort of conflict with each other. And so there's a balancing act here about what makes sense. And so that's why the property, uh, that could be an option. I'm not saying it is the option. It's one option on the table. Okay. Um, I think this is all we have on the um, on the pricing objectives. There's there's clearly uh, you know there are no right or wrong priorities or answers here, and I think that we can certainly come back to this when uh, there is an action item asking you to give us specific feedback about are you good with these themes? Do you want us to do you want to talk about more of this, etc. Um, so, any comments or questions? from the water commissions or the council members at this point? I'm not seeing any hands, Rosemary. Okay, great. I'm, I have, I'm trying to raise my hand, okay. sorry. <laughs> my name <Okay>. is Bruner. <laughs> I just wanted to um, say thank you to Rosemary for that exercise, and I'm happy to see, uh, I was curious for those results to see that the Water Commission, as well as the council members, uh, were similarly aligned in, in the priorities there, um, but it was really informative and helpful. Um, so thank you for that, Rosemary. You're most welcome. Thanks for the, your input. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on um, to the next item, which is, um, this are, these are a couple of items that we're ready to have you take action on that specifically help us to, to know, you know, how we're gonna structure the rates. So rather than waiting all the way to the end, this is a little bit like revenue requirements. And then there's a couple of nuances here. Let's talk this through so that we can make sure that when we do this, we don't have to go back and do this part over again because we changed our mind about it. So the first one has to do with elevation uh, surcharges. We've historically had elevation surcharges. The, the last time we did rates, it was kind of a one size fits all. I think everybody was paying 51 cents per, per 100 CCF of 748 gallons. Any place you were pumped, you were being paid, you were um, you know, paying that same amount. Um, I know from talking to, to Kyle Peterson, our customer services manager, that um, you know when they had to explain what this was to people, they were having a hard time wondering how come uh, you know I live down here and I'm getting you know one pump and the person that lives way up here is getting three pumps and they're paying the same as me. So this go round, we went through the process of you know, dividing our service area into three lift zones. The green lift zone is pumped once, so everywhere you see green on this means there's a tank that pumps the water to that area, uh, and it just goes from the, the gravity zone to that tank and then to the, to the customers. Any place that's pumped twice, the orange area, is these include, these are the, name, the names of the pumping stations. And you can see there's some smaller orange areas over here off of the Graham Hill Road and the Pasta Tampo area. Pretty much it's green and then this fairly good sized orange area over on the west side, these small orange areas here. And then the third uh, pump zone is, um, is the University Tank 6, which is uh, up here in this pink zone. So the current proposal that we would like for you to you know, give us approval to use is to basically create three pump zones. Uh, you pay 19 cents per 100 CCF for each pump zone. So if you're in pump zone one and you're using three, two units a 
month, you're paying 19 cents times two. If you're in pump zone two, you're paying 19 cents times four, basically, right? And if you're in pump zone three, you're paying 19 cents times uh, um, the, you know, the number of units times uh, three pump zones, so six. And for pretty much everybody uh, in this, except for the folks who are in pump zone three, it's less. It will be less money. And pump zone three, uh, it's going to be slightly more. Like I think they're currently paying 51 cents and they would pay 57 cents under this, um, this strategy. So that's the number, that's number one item um, under here, uh, under action items. The second item is, uh, and we talked with you a little bit about this elsewhere, uh, inside outside surcharge. It, was an, it has been used in a variety of ways over a very long period of time. And um, there is a document that if you'd like to read the 100 plus year or 85 year history, I can certainly provide it to you. But it was originally when we did this in 2016, when we did the analysis in 2016, it was intended to recover any area specific costs associated with providing water service to outside city customers. And the analysis that we did which I can show you all kind of tables on, but I decided to spare you, um, is basically split all the capital assets between those used by inside city customers only, by outside city customers only, and by shared. And then you use a strategy called equivalent meter units, which is a kind of a normalizing thing to say, you know, how would these costs be distributed based on equivalent meter units? The result of that is that you, it, we've seen in the analysis was in, conducted in 2014 and this year that there is a slight difference in, in the way those costs look on a per equivalent meter unit basis. And so the question then becomes, all right, is that, is that really, is that difference really associated only with outside city customers or is there something else involved with that? Um, what we would, what I would say now is that the the key here, and we and you saw this in the elevation surcharge, is that you have to treat similarly situated customers the same. This is one of, uh, as the city attorney mentioned earlier, there's quite a bit of legal body of work, if you will, that's evolving relative to the Prop 218 and and how that uh, that that whole construct is being applied in rate making. But one thing that's become clearer and clearer over the years is that similarly situated customers must be treated in the same manner. And it appeared to us from 2016 analysis that the issue between the inside city customers and the outside city customers was basically fewer connections per mile of asset or per dollar value of assets. So less dense population in the Live Oak area, for example, meant that there would be fewer connections to it, which meant there are fewer people to pay for the um, maintenance of the system. So it appeared to us based on that analysis that population density was a key factor, housing density, connection density was a key factor in the way that we, you know, that drove that analysis. And when we got into this review, uh, this map, which was um, linked in your document, was put forward as an example of the fact that population densities vary across the whole service area. This clearly is a larger part than just our service area. But you can see that there are some areas in the outside city um, customers that are denser and less dense, just as there are ones in the inside city area that are denser and less dense. And so the analysis that we conducted has lots of details to it, but in the end of the day, the recommendation is to eliminate the inside outside service uh, area surcharge because it does not appear to treat similarly situated customers in the same manner. If we were going to retain it, we would theoretically have to go to each one of the areas and look at population density and make a determination about whether that belongs in, you know, population density group A, B, or C, and that did not seem like a, 
strategy that was very tenable. I see that um, the city attorney has brought himself onto the onto the screen here. So, Tony, do you want to make a comment? I'm I'm just here to support uh, at this point. Um, I think that was a, a a very good simplification of the analysis that went into that with regard to. Um, really what the rate study did was it looked at a whole lot of different buckets of costs and it assigned a percentage value based on that inside outside density assumption and when we when we really carefully looked at it this time around we um, we basically came to the conclusion that if we were going to have an inside outside uh, surcharge uh, remain we would have to do a much more refined analysis and in the end of the day it really wouldn't make a great deal of difference in terms of the differential between outside and inside uh, and so that's why i think the recommendation uh, at this point boils down to just make them uniform is that fair rosemary absolutely thank you um so those are the two items that um, we're asking for the council to take action to approve the recommendation to change the elevation surcharges and to eliminate the surcharge for outside city customers. Um, those would be action items at this point. I don't know if there are questions or from the comments from the Water Commission. And Rosemary, you're looking to, again, I just want to make sure um, council members were, uh, so we're going to take all of these, we'll go through these actions in, in a motion later on tonight, but if you right. have questions. Right. I am not seeing any hands. Rosemary. Uh, okay, and we're at the end. Great. <coughs> Great. Um, very thorough and very helpful way that I think you've laid this out. So I appreciate that um, just from a personal perspective, super complicated um, and major discussion really for our community because for those who may be listening tonight, all of our water sources are locally derived. So we do not get a pipe from the Central Valley or any of the snowpack from the Sierra Nevada here in Santa Cruz. So when it comes to water, we are literally on our own here in Santa Cruz County. Not a lot of counties like that in, San, in, in California. So very important, um, obviously very important resource for our community. And um, so thank you, Rosemary, and everybody at the water team for, and especially the water commission for spending so much time on really one of the most critical questions we have before us is managing our water resources into the future. So thank you for, for the presentation. Rosemary, is there a slide that captures, I've got my, um, you know, my. Uh, yeah, and I'm, um, maybe it's this one. It's probably the very big beginning one. With the four actions on it. Yeah, I, I think the, um, yeah, I don't know if I can make this. I know it's in our packet. So I'm yeah, it's it. so, so fundamentally it's um, the five-year revenue requirements is when we've asked for um, authorization to use the revenue requirement. And then it's the, on the affordability analysis, we've asked for input on whether or not you want us to further pursue um, the possibility of putting uh, part of the, particularly the capital related charges on the property tax. And then uh, the pricing objectives, we've asked for you to give us your feedback on the themes that you saw and whether or not you're sort of good with that. And then finally, uh, it's the action item on the uh, elevation surcharge and elimination of inside outside surcharge. Yes. Okay, great. And for uh, council members, this this is the um, uh, obviously listed in the in the um, agenda item two. Uh, I will go ahead and um, ask if there are additional questions from the council at this time. Okay. I do see hands have just gone up. Uh, I have uh, Council Member Cummings, Council Member Watkins, Council Member Golder, and Council Member Colin Tari Johnson. So this will be for questions. 
and then I will um, take it out to uh, the public after questions from council for those who may be listening tonight. Go ahead, Council Member Cummings. Thanks, I had a question. Um, I wanna thank the Water Commission and all the Water Department staff for all their work on this. this was a really thorough presentation and to get so much detail in, um, I think it was really concise and really clear. So thank you all for everything you've done to help bring this forward. I did have a question um, regarding, um, I think it was the census data for calculating the affordability rates. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if that was the most recent census data and if it wasn't, is that gonna be recalculated? Is there any way, you know, when this comes back to us, we'll be able to see uh, kind of a comparison? Um, so this work was done in the fall, uh, in the kind of September, October timeframe of 2020. The new census data is just now becoming available, if I understand it correctly. So this is done based on American uh, Home Community Survey, which is a, a kind of a, a data set that is sort of kept up more current. Um, you know, year by year. So it does not include the most recent census data. As I mentioned, the plan would be for us to bring back and, a, 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 you know, this is kind of the, here's where we are and here's where we would be in five years if we adopted these rates. And, and it will use the most current data that is available from whether it's census data or something else. It will, when, that, when that product is developed, it will use the most current data that's available. Great, and then I guess a follow-up question to that. Um, you know, for the, and it's related, but with the rate changes that we make, uh, will there be kind of updates from time to time to determine whether or not we need to make any adjustments? Well, how we typically try to do this is we try to set them for a, um, for a five-year period, and, and there's a schedule that kind of gets adopted. and. We can make adjustments to them lower if, for example, we got a big grant for something and so our costs were affected in a positive way uh, as a result of that. We can make adjustments lower without doing a Prop 218 process. We can't make adjustments to either the structure of the rates or the cost of the rates without, that, that's higher without doing a 218 process. So. Typically, we try to do them, and the, and the five-year chunk seems to be the biggest chunk you can do, but to try to do them that way. Um, but you can always make decisions to not fully implement the, um, you know, the, the things that you've already approved. We did this list last year when we divided, decided to defer the rate increase that the council had approved in um, July of 2020, right? We didn't have to do a 218 process for that. We, we were able just to defer that for one year. Okay, right. those are all my questions, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And Council Member Watkins is next, please. Uh, thank you, Rosemary. Thank you to our commissioners as well. These are, as you mentioned, Mayor, this is really essential work that we're doing and, um, and critical. I guess I feel like, I, I think maybe my, I have a few comments and then maybe one question. Um, I do wonder more about the climate change overlay and to how this is all factored in with extreme weather events. And I know you've touched on it and I know that that's something you're, you're certainly thinking about. Um, but as we look at what we're seeing happen throughout our nation in terms of some of the water supply sources and toxic water flowing into certain areas, it's, it's something that I think we have to, you know, maintain um, at the forefront of what we're doing, and um, and and also the sort of the migratory patterns that we might see with increasing heat in certain areas in terms of just population growth, et cetera. So those are certain sort of things that I, I mean, I, as we move forward, definitely are are top of mind. I agree with the themes that emerged, and I also really understand um, the cost benefit and. Um, the pros and cons of them. And I I guess one of the thing, um, one, I have maybe two questions for clarification is one, in regards to the themes that uh, were brought forward that um, I feel capture what I would 
want to see as a priority area and, and, and certainly captures what the commission and the council sees as well. Um, but one thing I think I heard was that there was concern around some of the administration um, uh, that's going to be required to really ensure those things can get done. So I don't know if you want to just say a little bit more about that or how maybe that's going to be the planning that gets factored in, but um, in terms of the implementation, ease of implementation and oversight. And then the last thing I wanted to ask about was the property tax, and I appreciate the correlation that you um, made in regards to these investments really being essential to our city, right, and to our property, um, the, the property taxpayers in terms of the long-term investment. Um, but you were saying that not a whole bunch of jurisdictions have these um, kind of blended structures and sort of there were certain nuggets. And so are you envisioning that we would have sort of this kind of unique Santa Cruz hybrid potential proposal coming forward in the future? Um, yeah, so I think those are my sort of my two clarifying questions. Okay. Um, so the ease of implementation is a, a it's a really good uh, challenging comment, and you know this is always the uh, it's it's sort of the the tension around you know what can you do, and you know frankly you can do almost anything right you could you could decide every household could have its own water budget based on how many people live there and you know you could make it every one completely separate, or you can do it in the opposite direction, which is to say, now it, it, you're all gonna pay the same. It's, it, you know, the one the example I think I used in one of the conversations I had in, uh, in advance of this meeting was, okay, so you go to Comcast and you don't say, well, I use it on Tuesdays, but I don't use it on Fridays. And, you know, they just tell you to write them a check and they don't care whether you use it at all, right? And so that's the, that's sort of one end of the spectrum and very, very uh, in the weeds, you know, very uh, individualized is at the end, other end of the spectrum. And somewhere in between there is something that's both implementable easy for customers to understand it's, it's implementable in the you know to get it put together and then to maintain right because you know i've got customer service people who answer sixty thousand phone calls a year and a chunk of that is explaining to people what in the heck this bill means and so making it so that it's transparent and easily understandable is a really big priority the second comment I want to make is, has to do with the, uh, the with the property tax thing, and you know it's a very common uh, for wastewater utilities to be on the property tax. It's not it's not done in Santa Cruz City, but it is done in Santa Cruz County. And the reason that it's that if you think about why we don't see so many water utilities on the property tax bill. It has to do with policy decisions we've made over the last 30 years in the water side to think about how to send price signal, signals to people about the value of water through the structure of their rates. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that in, you know, if you're gonna send a, a bill to the county comptroller auditor once a year that they're gonna put onto the property tax, it can't have, you know, can't make assumptions about somebody's gonna use this much water in the winter and that much water in the summer. It's gotta be based on something that's fixed and relative to something to that property, a meter size, for example. So it's, it's one of the reasons that you don't see that strategy getting used broadly. But I'm guessing that probably before, you know, 1960, it might've been quite common because utilities were flat the services, and in many cases, that's why you see wastewater utilities on the property tax bill because they're the same monthly in and out for many for many um, entities anyway. Great, no, thank you for those clarifications. I really, I really appreciate it, and I follow, I follow your logic for sure. And next up, I have uh, Councilmember Golder. Thank you, Rosemary, and everybody. I think uh, it's funny, I was writing questions and I kept crossing them off because your presentation was so thorough. But there's one I still have. I know you mentioned that we still have to fund everything locally, and I'm assuming that means nothing's coming you know, from the federal and the state level. That being said, is there any um, 
infrastructure that we can share or uh, with our regional neighbors like SoCal, SLV, Scotts Valley, and then just for comparison, like how do our rates compare to our in-county uh, neighboring yeah. jurisdictions? Um, so with respect to sharing infrastructure, certainly on the water supply uh, side of the house, we're definitely looking at that and all the time. And, you know, we're working right now up in the Santa Margarita groundwater basin with Scott Valley and, um, and San Lorenzo Valley and, you know, trying to look at regional projects and thinking about how to do things that solve more than one, one person or one entity's problem, for example. So the answer is, especially in this county, because we are all isolated, whether you're on groundwater or on surface water, it makes a lot of sense for us to work together regionally. And that has been something that we've been doing for a long time. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised that, um, you know, that some kind of regional projects emerge um, for implementation. And you will uh, recall that sometime maybe late last year or early this year, I forget, we the, the council approved an extension of agreement between us and the SoCal Creek Water District to do these water transfers for another sort of five-year window. So it's something that's already happening on a small scale and likely will be happening on a larger scale going forward. As far as the rates, like what would someone oh. call or SLV or, you know, uh, uh, SoCal pay versus like what residents of the city or that we're, what we're paying? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't have that yet, but when we bring back proposed rates, we'll bring that. I mean, because it changes all the time. We have an old version from uh, 20, excuse me, 16, but it's not up to date. We haven't updated it yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Contar Johnson. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, I want to echo uh, what my colleagues have said, and thank you, Rosemary, and your team and the Water Commission for this incredible work. This was a lot of information and very dense, but presented in a very clear way. So thank you for that. Um, a lot of my questions have been asked, but I do have sort of comment questions on a couple of the areas. Um, so going back to the um, property tax option, I've seen the agenda report that uh, Marin Municipal Water District moved to a similar structure. I'm wondering if you could touch on um, how, that's, how that's worked out for them, how it's generated revenue, whether there were impacts on renters, um, what, what the impacts have been after three years of shifting to this fee structure. Uh, for that community. And then, uh, so I'll just I'll ask all my questions yeah. and, then, and then I'll pause. And then the water affordability analysis really, really struck me. Um, and your comments around the definitions around um, how there are specific definitions around a struggling service area and how we don't fit that definition and that we 21% 20, of our households will be um, in, the, in the high, high burden, uh, um, excuse me, high affordability. So I think, yeah. I, I don't know if it's a question or just a, I mean, this is, this is something that we um, struggle with as a community in general because of, of our, our size and our census, we don't fit into a lot of these definitions. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if you've connected with other communities that have the same are in the same situation. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what question there is. It just really <laughs> struck me. <laughs> yeah, that's a very inequitable way of defining yeah. uh, disadvantaged, struggling areas, and, and what we can do about that. Yeah, I don't know. So those those are sort of my comments and questions. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thanks for those great questions. So the, with respect to the Marin situation. Uh, I we haven't done a lot of research and checking out with them about how it's gone. And certainly, if if we were um, if if you give us direction to pursue this, that's the kind of stuff we'll do, right? We'll we'll do some additional research. I know that uh, Sanjay Gar has been working, you know, this works all over the state and um, probably broader than that on with utilities, and, and so he's a, they're a very good uh, source of contact for where this. You know, people have thought of this and why they've done it if they haven't done it. Um, so, so that is the kind of work we would do going forward if you give us direction to at least bring you something to further consider. 
Um, with respect to the um, the definition of disadvantaged communities, I, I'll dig up the actual specific de definition. I should have done that beforehand and sent it out to you. It, it has sort of bothered me from the get-go about this just doesn't, you know, it, it means that unless you have, this is, you know, people with low income or other kinds of conditions that fit into this mold that all live together, you don't get to be, you know, you don't get to be considered as having challenges. And that's clearly just not the case, right? And so I think that, that one of the, um, the conversation about affordability and the conversations about equity of access are really important conversations that are beginning to really get going nationwide now. And I think that's really a positive thing because you can't divide things in quite the neat little way that they've divided things up to now. Mm -hmm. Things are a little bit more complicated. I mean, one of the one of the major chunks of money in the in the uh, Biden infrastructure bill that came out earlier this week is you know billions of dollars for um, replacement of lead service lines. Well, we don't have lead service lines here, but if you live in Chicago or if you live in you know Milwaukee or some other places, you've got lead service lines. But the rich people have them just as much as the poor people, right? So they're not. So that those that money is going to you know flow to uh, deal with that sort of public health issue associated with those particular you know ancient pieces of infrastructure. But but I think that uh, this is a big issue that that's starting to get talked about in a much broader way without quite so uh, so great a kind of let's draw a nice little circle around it so we don't have to, you know, think about it and as, as as big an issue as it really is. Mm -hmm. well, that's great to hear. So maybe some space and opportunity for state and national advocacy, yeah. how we redefine it. Thank you so much. Those are my questions. Next, I have Vice Mayor Bruner and then Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. And thank you for presenting all of those components uh, in such a great way. <laughs> and I know I asked a lot of questions early on. Um, I'm still, if you could clarify, um, let me go to my notes, the census data, the poverty and income maps. When it comes to multi-unit sharing one meter, how is that represented? So this work was done on a housing unit basis. So the the um, each one of the housing blocks mm -hmm. or each one of the census group blocks has a number of housing units. It includes both the multifamily and the single family uh, residences in there. And the data we did provide to the consultant who did this work, the data for the properties, uh, well, all of our properties, the multifamily, single family. And so he assigned those out to the, to the geographic blocks and they're represented there as, you know, a number of, prop, number of households uh, versus what are the costs associated with uh, service to that to those number of multifamily households in that census block, right? So the cumulative information about median household income, median housing costs are done based on each one of the housing units. Okay. Okay, thank you. And 21% of the households are already struggling, and and that was the percentage you had mentioned. Yeah. So so the conclusion was that you know from the sort of uh, high burden to the moderately high burden, that's the 21%. And and again, it's based on uh, median household income. And you know we had the question earlier about particularly in a place like Santa Cruz, which has a student population, and this was this was 2019 data, so, you know, the COVID hadn't really affected it. In a place like Santa Cruz, are those folks who really are trying to figure out how to make ends meet and, um, you know, therefore their, their 
not being able to pay their bills or they're struggling with that or are there folks you know who are paying their bills because someone else is paying their bills basically right. um i will tell you that we go ahead Feedback. I'm sorry, feedback. I will tell you that we have looked at shut off maps uh, for where places in our community that where we've hung uh, 48 hour notices, which is a pretty common thing before the COVID, you know, please pay your bill within 48 hours, we're gonna turn you off. We've looked at actual shut offs. They don't congregate, they don't congregate in one part of the city or another. So there's not a correlation between where people are shut off or are noticed that they're going to be shut off and those census block groups we saw. Don't ask me why, but there's not. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Council Member Brown? Yeah, thank you. I'll add my uh, appreciation and, and many thanks for, uh, as always, a really clear and well-organized presentation. And I'm sure a lot of work <laughs> went into that and you all, you make it look um, so understandable and, and uh, <laughs> you know. Thank God. <laughs> the, uh, well, and, and the, you know, it just feels overwhelming when I think about it, but you know, you give us ways to try to, you know, to wrap our minds around it and make decisions. And I just so appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the water commissioners as well. Uh, I just had a follow-up question on the, the property tax, the idea of potentially shifting capital infrastructure costs to property tax bills. And I know this is, I'm intrigued by the idea, so I will see what my colleagues think when the time comes. Um, but I do think it's worth exploring. Um, in terms of how, and maybe this is a question that would be for further research if we decide to go in that direction. Um, but in terms of the uh, the question about how to how to make that the process for making that happen, I'm you know I'm I'm sensitive to the administrative burden uh, that you all faced and yeah. also communications about changes and all of those things. And and so I'm just wondering, is that something that um, you feel like is um, is feasible or might be feasible. I mean, obviously you're bringing it to us, so there's some potential there. But, but what does that look like from what, based on what you know now, how to get there if we were right. to So in, in a lot of ways, it's pretty darn simple. It, uh, not the communication part of it with the customers and making sure there's clarity. That, that's, a, a, that's a challenge, there's no doubt about it. But the actual mechanism is you would set a rate based on kind of the amount of revenue we collect right now and the infrastructure reinvestment fee would be the surrogate for it because that that revenue is currently set to recover the cost of pay-as-you-go capital and debt service, which is all the capital-related costs, right? So we would set a, an annual charge and it would be distributed, or we would say how much revenue we need to collect, it would be distributed by meter size across the, the whole range of meters and then annually, in something I think it's August, we would send to the county comptroller a list of all the APNs that it's applied to, and the total, you know, the total dollar amount, and it goes on to the tax bill. And you know, the next thing you know, okay, you're getting your you're getting your money, and the and. Because the city is a member, I believe, of what's called the teeter plan, it means that the um, the tax payments are remitted, the, the amount due is remitted to the entities, and if they're not paid, the county deals with it. So from a, from a rate, um, a, a rating agency, a credit rating agency perspective, you know, putting it on the tax bill has the bonus of having people, having the rating agencies see that you have a really strong way of getting your revenue from, you know, the necessary revenue you need. Um, so that's a good thing. It does, it does involve a 1% charge of the total amount that's being collected. Um, it probably does result in some changes to our cost of 
associated with billing, whether it's fewer you know, calls or as the bills get bigger, especially over time, you know, more people struggling, et cetera, um, those kinds of things that might not be as much of an issue. So that's what we know about it. And there, there has been some legal analysis, of, you know, preliminary legal analysis, and uh, Edith Driscoll said to me when a conversation I had with her, she said, if it's legal, it's fine with us. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting idea, I think. It has its challenges from a communication thing and making people don't, you know, not think that you're hiding the ball, that kind of thing. Thank you. I appreciate your your thinking on this. Okay. Um, I have one question and then I'll turn it over to the, um, I'll turn it back to for public comment. Um, I understand where basically the the the, uh, the water commission's recommendation is to use I think you called it scenario scenario four right I just yes. want to confirm that publicly and my question was so there was an extension unlike the other scenario two and three of of another five years to pay down to basically try to kind of spread obviously those investments over a longer period of time and I'm just curious. What 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 made twenty years fail? I guess is my question. Uh, oh, gonna look at extending that out over a you know. I'm just curious whether that debt burden just was too long, too high, or just curious what what made that. So so a lot of the stuff that we've got in the window is a thing that if you wanted to spread it out longer, it would mean spreading out the construction. I, I'll give you an example. The the concrete tanks project is a you know two and a half or three year construction. Um, if you were if you were trying to manage your costs to spread them out over a longer period of time, and you have those kinds of projects, then you end up you know in theory having to spread the construction window out longer in order to spread the cost out over a longer period of time. And there's a point at which that's a diminishing return, right? Right, got it. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great, thank you. I'll go ahead and, um, unless there's any other council member questions or questions from commissioners, I will go ahead and turn it over to members of the public now. And if you're interested in commenting on the policy briefing and action on various water department long-term financial planning and rate making topics, Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and when it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. You can pr then press star six to speak, and then the timer will be set to two minutes. And I see two uh, attendees, two folks in the public who would like to comment on this item. Um, the first phone number ends in 1810. Yeah, this is Gary Phillip. The city has a monopoly utility and in that sense does not operate in a competitive environment and is in a position to abuse that on purpose or not. The water bill as well as all municipal utilities are not a cash cow to be milked. Uh, so you need a principled approach to management of that resource. It is not a really fair uh, comparing income census blocks to determine rates. It, it just isn't. Income has no basis to determine water rates. We're buying water like anything else. Uh, fix uh, fees for all property taxes in any form makes no sense. There are Prop 13 considerations. There are usage differences not related to property tax. And a diverse population in any um, census district exist. In the end, this is about buying water, period. After all, costs are received, uh, are recovered, excuse me. Water should be cheap in wet years especially. This chatter in these, you know, about water affordability reads a bit like socialist nonsense. Water is not to be used as your version of a social justice instrument like welfare. We have welfare for that, and cities have zero welfare responsibility, at least insofar as charging some people more and some you know, less based on their territorial average income location. Progressive taxation should have that pretty much uh, you know, as a social program covered, and if it doesn't, that is the federal government's decision. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next number ends in 1847. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Linda Wilshusen. Uh, from 2013 to 2020, I was a member of the Water Commission representing outside city customers. I'd like to um, uh, convey my support for recommendation number three on your agenda, which is to approve the elimination of the rate surcharge for outside city customers. And I'd like to thank the water director, the water commission, city management, the city attorney, and the city council for supporting this recommendation. Uh, it, it's a good time to put the outside city surcharge behind us and allow us to move forward with the important work of repairing, upgrading, and financing our municipal water system. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate you calling in. Welcome back, Linda. <laughs> okay. And um, I see uh, Sir Ryan also with your hand. Yeah, before, before you start your deliberations, I just wanted to um, thank the staff for their excellent summary of the Water Commission's recommendations over the past eight or nine months. There was a lot of a lot of work that went into what felt like a fairly brief presentation, all things considered, and um, they just did a fantastic job synthesizing our um, consensus and our comments and, and concerns were all addressed um, well before it made it um, to presenting before you today. So I just really want to thank them and, you know, thank you on behalf of the entire Water Commission for taking the time to focus on this subject, which is, you know, dearly important to our community here. Um, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Seeing no other members of the public, I'll turn this back to the council for comment and deliberation. Uh, and just for the public, um, we are basically being asked um, by motion to accept the Water Commission's recommendation and authorize staff to use the Water Commission's recommended forecast of future revenue requirements for fiscal year 2023 through fiscal year 2027 in its financial planning and rate making work to provide direction to staff as appropriate regarding exploring shifting some part of the monthly utility bill revenue collection to property tax. Three would be to approve the elimination of the rate surcharge for the outside city customers. And four is to approve the revised approach to elevation surcharges and authorize staff to integrate approach into ongoing water rate making work. So those are that's our uh, requested actions for tonight and I will uh, look for further deliberation by the council. I see council member Watkins, please. And then council. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. And then council member Cummings after you. Are you okay, okay, apologize. Um, no, I'm just happy to move the recommendation as you stated it in is um, listed in our agenda report and welcome any kind of additional comments or direction associated with the various items that accompany those um, elements. But I just also want to echo our, you know, the, the thanks and appreciation for the really a, just in critical and important work and the, um, the really thorough truncated version of the presentation that we were presented with this evening. So um, thank you all for all your work, you know, and, um, and I know it's ongoing and um, we're lucky to have a really great committed community and a really excellent um, and stellar uh, team here at the city. So with that, I'm happy to move the recommendation as presented. And Council Member Watkins on item two, which is provide direction to staff as appropriate regarding exploring shifting. So your motion would, would um, basically say that staff should explore that. Is that the direction? Yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, yeah, given the conversation and sort of just the insights into what could be possible there, I think it's worth exploring unless there's any concerns or additional input from my colleagues or commissioners or staff. Um, that's sort of the overall sentiment that I heard. Okay, great. I have Council Member Cummings and then Vice Mayor Bruner in that order. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a question. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, it seemed like in the report that we were provided, there were five recommendations, <clears throat> and yet four were presented. And so, I just wanted to get some clarification on that. The fifth, the fifth one is the um, water pricing objectives. I apologize that that's a sort of input on water pricing objectives. There was a slide in the presentation about the themes, and so. Um, you know, you, if you have things to add about that, that'd be great. But that's what we're looking for there. Great. I was just, I was just curious because um, I just wanted to make sure we captured everything. Right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to second the motion. Great. So we have a first by Council Member Watkins and a second by Council Member Cummings. And Mayor, if, if I may, real quick, and, and to the um, maker of the motion, I'm just. I think you got muted, Justin. Oh, there you go. It was just just for clarification that um, we'd include that additional um, recommend, staff recommendation. Yes, definitely. So that would be uh, reflecting, um, Bonnie, the um, the present the presented um, the presented uh, rolled up uh, objectives that were presented. Yes. Correct. For Water policy themes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Where are those in the PowerPoint? Okay. Nobody stated that yet. Is, are they in the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. There is a slide that has those that Sanjay uh, presented, I believe. Correct, Rosemary? Yes. Um, hold on a second. I can tell you which slide it is. And I, I can articulate these for you. Uh, it's. It's uh, slide number uh, 44. Basically says the priorities are ensure that water for essential use is affordable and accessible, provide sufficient and stable revenues to meet uh, operating and capital and customer service levels, maintain transparency and equity for capital and water reliability needs. The maker of the motion, okay to add those? Yeah. And the seconder. Thanks. Okay, I have uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, and then I'm going to put myself in the queue. I just have one comment. Thank you. I was also going to second that motion and clarify that item too, um, and um, just say that you know given all the legally required inputs and making sure we're aligning with community goals and really investing in our infrastructure. Um, and as several commissioners pointed out, we just can't put off any more. Really uh, pleased and applaud you for this work to this point. And I'm glad we can continue forward with some, some um, sustainability for this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just had one comment on the property tax um, component to this. So, and maybe it's a question for Tony. Um, and only because I, weirdly enough, I have a little, I, well, I do have experience with this because this is what we use in our groundwater agency to actually raise our, to raise our revenues to operate the groundwater agency. In my understanding, under the under the Constitution, just based on what we do, Tony, this we call this a regulatory fee, though. So you know, we we have those powers under the Constitution, okay. under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So those were afforded to us. But is this? So I've always thought of 218 as you have to. I mean, you, you, we do have to do a notification, but this would not go to a vote then. This is just a notification, and unless we had uh, protests, we would be able to levy that, correct? Um, yes, and and um, just a little bit of background. Uh, groundwater uh, extraction charges, and I'm not sure what the nature of the fee is that you're talking about, but- Ours is just for administrative, administrative um, piece, uh, basically administrative and planning right now. Okay. We don't charge an extraction fee, yeah. Um, in, in any event, uh, water service charges are property related fees or charges, and uh, they're subject to the requirements of Proposition 218, and putting the charge on the tax roll would not change that. So what you would essentially have is the Prop 218 notice 
which would be to adopt the rates. Uh, and you can do that, um, you can adopt a rate schedule up to a five-year period uh, with gradually increasing rates. <clears throat> and then annually, you will do a, uh, basically a calculation of the charges applicable to all of the parcels that will be subject to the, to the charge. And that's done by resolution. And it's just applying the rates to the individual parcels and creating a big spreadsheet and then adopting another resolution ordering that the charges be added to the t to the tax rolls by the county assessor. Okay. So it's, it, it has, you have to do both processes, but it's very common. It's more common for sewer agencies than it is for water agencies, but it seems like water agencies are starting to lean in the direction of putting things on the tax roll for, for this type of capital infrastructure facility charge. Yeah, I, can, I, I appreciate the comment, I think, Rosemary, that you mentioned on sort of the benefit to the property, obviously to the to the property. I mean, property becomes devalued pretty fast if you have water. <laughs> right. Yeah. And do you have a comment as yeah. well? I heard yeah, just, just a clarification. So um, with the GSAs and the admin, as we also do that kind of work, so I'm familiar with that nature. That falls under Prop 26, and so that's why it's, okay. it's that venue. And with Prop 26, 26, um, you don't need to do a Prop 218 notice. I mean, it's a different route. Right. And, yeah. and as you said, it's a regulatory fee. Right here with this fee, this would follow the Prop 218 process. Um, you would have to have this administrative record, which is one of the deliverables we will provide. Um, you would have to send a, out a notice to the property owners for 45 days. You have the public hearing. Um, as long as the majority of the pro, uh, property owners don't protest, city council could consider the adoption. And if city council does adopt it, um, then as mentioned, um, you could put this on the property roll. And there is a procedure associated with it. And it's normal with, uh, then it falls exactly very similar to the GSA approach, because then you're just putting on the ATN and parcel. Thank you for that clarification. So would this track to, so if you put it on the property tax roll, but you know, someone's got a home that they bought in 1972, so that assessment is really, really low, and then you've got someone who bought a home in 2021, and that's, you know, the property tax, you know, went up 1%. So you, how do you, how do you deal with that disparity? <laughs> it doesn't, um, it's not based on the value, uh, property value. tax assessment at all. Okay. It's like some some parcel taxes are twenty dollars a parcel, or right. you know, so it's just a base fee, then it gets attached to the parcel. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank and you. just a clarification: it, we, we would most likely our recommendation would be based on meter size. Got it. So every property has a meter, and larger your meter, more capacity and more infrastructure use you could use. So thus, it makes sense for you to pay more for this infrastructure charge. Right. Got it. Thank you. Those are my questions. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion uh, by Council Member uh, Watkins, uh, seconded by Council Member uh, Cummings uh, to accept the Water Commission's recommendation and authorize staff to use the Water Commission's recommended forecast of future revenue requirement for fiscal years 2023 through fiscal year 2027 in its financial planning and rate making work. Two, to provide direction, we provided direction to staff um, regarding uh, exploring shifting some of the part of the monthly utility bill revenue collection to property tax, which we have said, um, yes, please explore that. Uh, three is to approve the elimination of the rate surcharge for outside city customers. Four would be approving the revised approach to elevation surcharges and authorize staff to integrate approach into ongoing water rate making work. And five would be to um, confirm the water pricing objectives as provided uh, and the high priority scenes uh, in the motion language here. So that is our motion this evening, and I will go ahead and um, call for a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? 
Aye. And Mayor Myers. Aye. So that motion carries unanimously. And that concludes our uh, meeting for this evening. Again, thank you to Water Defense Department staff and the whole team. And uh, thank you for, to the Water Commissioners who joined us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Hey, everybody.